So, hello, uh, my name is Dominic Meek. I work up in the Glasgow and I've been um, asked to give a talk on femoral revision surgery uh, for the uh, London South Training uh, Group. I think when you're thinking about uh, revision surgery, uh, it's to, uh, important to try and be as conservative as possible. So you have to think ahead what may occur with the next revision and obviously take into account the age of the patient uh, of the younger patient, the more conservative you wish to be. And there may be a, a need for variable implant approach and you have to consider the best implant for the individual patients. When we're considering what sort of revisions we're doing, where is unusual for the femoral side, it's often going to be the acetabular side that uh, you may want to revise the stem for. We'll obviously concentrate on quite a bit on loosening and the classification of that, and how that will affect what sort of surgery you undertake. But there may be other reasons that you need to take under a femoral revision. These can include dislocation, infection, and peripacetic fractures. The best known classification probably for, you'll know of the uh, femoral side is the Petrovsky, divided into four, uh, five types really. There's type one, where you've really got a normal, both metaphysis and diaphysis, and any form of reconstruction is possible there. The type two, you've actually lost quite a lot of the metaphysis, but still have an intact uh, diaphysis. You then uh, classified it into a 3A and a 3D, and this was really to do with the type of revision stem being had. The metaphysis is lost in both of these, but in the difference between the 3D and the 3A is that there's no longer four to six centimeters of scratch fit. And this is because of the type of stem you used uh, relied in this. Um, extensive contact with the diaphysis for fixation. Going beyond that, you get into the type four, and these are really where it's quite a stove pipe type uh, femur where there's loss of um, integrity of both the diaphysis and the metaphysis. Um, and we'll come on to there at them uh, later on. The main um, point is that 90% of the um, types of revisions that you want to take to the femur are really going to be types one, two, or, or three A. And then you can see Petrovsky is actually happier now because he's in his, uh, his uh, surgical uh, um, outfit. I'm just going to go backwards, first of all, to a bit of a Cinderella uh, subject, which is cement. Cement has been around for fixation of the femur since 1953, even predating Charnley. Uh, this is when a dentist actually in America uh, used it to fix. Uh, ephemeral stem and actually Charlie did a borrow this acrylic uh, idea for the fixation. And the thing about cement, if it's done well, it will be very reproducible in its results, very reliable, and will we'll come on to the fact it's actually modular, and it's really relatively cheap and physiologically loads the skeleton well. Obviously I'm coming from Glasgow and up in Glasgow we have something called the Glasgow Kiss. I think more uniformly, um, another thing that you could think of this is just keeping it simple. And because of that, in the event of that you do need to do a revision on the femoral side, having to take out very well fixed cement is challenging, in fact, time consuming and risks perforation or damage to the femur. So the logical extension of this is actually not to remove the cement and do a cemented cement revision. And indeed, Seth Greenwell did this over 30 years ago in the States. And since then, uh, Chick Ranawat wrote it up for cement and cement revision, again back in 1993. And if we look, there have been progressive papers showing the um, technique has been used uh, well. And indeed, if we go to the Exeter group, they have a five to 15 year review with excellent results of cement and cement revision. And even if you go out of these centers and look at a review that came from the Norwegian hip registry, uh, which was included John Timperley reviewing this, we can see that it actually was quite a successful um, technique, um, although it did appear that the implant stem design was more suited if you did a slip taper design rather than an anatomical design, but you're still getting in the high 90% survivals at six years. It's also a useful technique because if you remove a cemented stem, it greatly improves the access for looking at the acetabulum and avoids doing pocket dissections to, if you have to, um, to having to retain the stem. You have to remember as a technique, if you're taking out a cemented stem, always clear the shoulder 
Otherwise, you can end up with an iatrogenic fracture of the greater trochanter. So particularly if it's not a straight taper stem and there's a curve to it, clear out the shoulder. It's also useful if you wanted to look at recurrent dislocations. In this case, it's, an, it's allowed you to increase the offset, alter the version, and also increase the head size. Um, and this has just been a very simple operation with minimum blood loss um, because there's no actual um, opening up of the femur itself. And as we can see, you can adjust by sinking the stem within the original cement anto more or leaving it more proud, changing the femoral offset and antiversion. You can three dimensionally put the femoral head in a whole range of positions in order to optimize it. It has also been used in peripsetic fractures when we um, look at the Vancouver um, V2s. Um, often these fractures, when they occur at the tip, are not really great to actually fix, and you can actually secure them by doing an immediate intramedullary nailing with cement. And the advantage of using cement, particularly in more elderly patients, is that you can get immediate full weight bearing with them and not worry about any subsidence. It can also be used in infection, and the reason that you can use it's nice to use cement is you can choose the antibiotic and you can use it through the local type of bacteria that you have. And this has been constantly shown by the lower rates of aseptic loosening in joint registries when you use antibiotic cement. You can use vancomycin, tobramycin, and indeed there's a whole range of ones that you can use depending on the type of bacteria that you're worried about. And this has actually led to the uh, um, uh, um, people developing a, a technique for actually leaving the femoral cement. So it's evolved into a technique where, where in Exeter, they do a two-stage revision, leave the cement, and then cement back into it with antibiotic loaded cement. And the results have been quite promising with this. However, we'll come on to now the, the actually where you do get cement loss and, uh, and bone loss in combination. So we'll go through some of these individually. The type one femoral deficiency, there's minimum loss. You can do a cemented or uncemented stem. Uh, they're very easy to do. Um, so here, for instance, this is a hemiarthroplasty, which hasn't got fixation. It's removed, but you've got intact um, lesser trochanter and diaphysis. The type 2, you've actually got more extensive loss of the metathesis. You've still got the intact diaphysis. Sometimes this means that you will actually have to do impaction grafting if you want to restore the bone stock. But, but cement is still a pretty good option for these. So in this case, if it was a younger patient, you would consider doing an impaction graft. The type 3 AIDS is more extensive femoral loss. The metaphysis is now very badly damaged um, and uh, you start to get more loss of the actual diaphysis as well. And you can see as this progresses on, you can actually begin to lose the um, isthmus. Uh, and these means that you start to get poorer results if you use the classical extensive coordinated implants. And type 4, still quite very poor bone quality, high. Um, medullary to cortex ratio, and in these sort of ones, you are talking probably more proximal femoral replacement. These are the sort of things that people have put forward, uh, first of all, particularly in North America, the devices to use. This is the traditional solution stem, where you've got an extensive coracote, which we talked about the four to six centimeter scratch bit metathesis. Um, you can have ones that are just splines and go for metathesial fixation, but obviously once you get beyond the type one, these are um, not so useful. Uh, these are the ones where they brought in modularity to the extensive core of folks. You can separate the actual stem from the metathesis, and this can allow better um, restoration of leg length and of offset. And then finally, there's a tape, the workhorse of um, revision surgery, which is the modular taper stem, where the taper stem engages the diaphysis, and again, you have a spout body you can adjust the length version and offset it. But really what we want to do is say that this is not the goal to do the mega prosthesis. We don't want to be ending up with this sort of thing. We want to be as conservative as possible. And that's where we come to the type two, I would say impaction grafting is something to certainly consider. It has reproducible excellent results, just that you need to avoid producing any stress risers of tips. Uh, so for instance, here you perhaps even need a prophylactic plate in situ. But we look at some of the results that produced by uh, the extra group. We have Matt Wilson and Gwen Gay producing femoral impaction graft in 705 cases. 
excellent results for aseptic loosening when we obtain up over 95%. So a reliable technique that reproduces the, um, uh, the bone uh, from that. However, if we start getting onto the type 3A, this is the ones where traditionally people would use the extensive pore coat in North America. And I'd say this relied on four to six centimeters of scratch fit. It meant, however, we started getting beyond the isthmus, got very large stems, and it started to produce thigh pain, fracture, and stress shielding. It also had a fixed offset, and that made it difficult to restore leg restoration absolutely. And here's a typical example. We lost the metaphysis. Um, there's a little bit of loss down in the diaphysis. They've had an osteotomy to remove the cement, and they have an extensive four to six centimeters of scratch fit. And the results for this over the years have uh, produced reproducibly good results, um, but they did tend to result in some stress shielding. Of interest, though, that they did actually get associated with interrupted fractures. Uh, these could be either the greater trochanter, for instance, but you could get the series where you got diaphyseal fractures extending at the tip. Uh, and uh, these sometimes require to have uh, prophylactic cabling or an actual cabling. And occasionally you could get perforations which wouldn't necessarily need revision, but obviously uh, they're less than ideal. We actually looked in Vancouver at the um, incidence of these and wrote them back up in uh, the late 2000. Um, there was actually 30% incidence in these solution stems of interrupted fractures. They were principally associated with the poor Petroska classification with longer stems and diameters over 18, milli milli over 18 millimeters. They were particularly associated with the straight in the bow, suggesting the bow wasn't sufficient to actually compensate um, for the femoral bowing itself, um, nor was it associated with uh, surgical approach. It mainly occurred when either the stem or the trial was being inserted, uh, and sometimes when the cement was being removed. Mainly there were diaphyseal splits, but you could get perforations in 60% of cases. Um, and the diaphyseal splits, when they occurred, were associated with poor bone stock, under reaming, and again, larger stems, and with a high metallic cortex ratio value in our cortex. Interestingly enough, however, the functional outcomes of these patients was not significantly affected. So if they were dealt with as an interoperative fracture, it didn't affect the outcome, um, either in terms of function or SFS scores or satisfaction. And the interesting enough, Interrupted fractures are actually associated with better ingrowth results and of only a 3% fibrous ingrowth, where those that were lean uh, line to line actually only 67% uh, had an unstable ingrowth. So, relatively common interrupted fractures in these types of stem, but it didn't really affect final outcome if it was uh, uh, dealt with. Um, and yet, when you have these large diameter stems, Perhaps you should be thinking of doing a distal taper or impaction grafting as an alternative technique. They actually did go on to bring out a modular core coat, which was uh, allowing you to more extensively adjust for leg length and offset, um, but still uh, had a scratch fit principle. So you really want to use it in ones where there's a lack of four to six centimeters. Just a note, we actually will be publishing later this year a paper on the modular taper stem versus modular stems uh, from the historic series. And this actually demonstrated there's a slightly more millimeter or two substance in the tapered stem rather than the coracle, um, but not really of any clinical significance in terms of subsidence uh, when this was measured. But what was of note that when an extended trochanteric osteotomy was performed, there was substantially more substance of the cylindrical coracle stems. So this suggests that if you have got a condition where the proximal bone has had an osteotomy or a fracture, you probably should consider a taper stem rather than a cylindrical stem as they're more likely to subside in those cases. So to summarize, substance of cylindrical stem um, has to have four to six centimeters of scratch fit. Um, so here's an example where it probably shouldn't have been used. This is a peripatetic fracture around the cemented extra stem. You can see extending down to the isthmus. Um, difficult to guarantee four to six centimeters of scratch fit in this. And indeed, the fracture itself meant it was acting almost as an extended trochanteric osteotomy as well. 
patient underwent revision surgery requiring augmentation, uh, can I ask a tabular side, fixation of the femur, and then there's an attempt put in to do a, a coracotid cylindrical stem. When we look at that, even before the staples have been removed, significant substance of the stem resulting in dislocation. The patient then was revised to actually impaction grafting of a long cemented stem, immediately able to wait there and no further issues from that. This brings us really on to the taper modular stem, which is really known as the workhorse of the revision hip surgery. It's got a long track record really based on the Wagner stem, uh, which was originally monoblock, but now using it as a modular type stem and plenty of reports showing its use uh, where it's actually had good results um, in the medium to even longer term now. Um, the advantage of the modularity being that you can reproduce the offset and uh, reduce the chance of getting dislocation. Plenty of papers, as I say here, uh, looking at uh, the overall uh, results uh, with fairly good results. However, like all things, the innovation of the junction resulted in sometimes getting junction failure and a fracture. Uh, when it was looked at, it seemed to be associated with using smaller stems, uh, particularly um, in the larger BMI patients um, and with higher offsets. Uh, since then, of course, the trunnion has been actually developed by quite a few companies. Um, the instance appears to be lowering, um, but it's still it's theoretically present. I think therefore, it's a useful point at this point, just to go back to the original monoblock revision stem and just to understand what we mean by taper fixation. So this was the original Wagner stem produced back in 1983. And the trouble with it is often it was just used to make three point fixation. And if it's just got three points, actually um, could sometimes subsidize, uh, undergo subsidence and it also could be painful as well. So there was quite a high instance of thigh pain in these cases, um, and particularly at the tip. And it wasn't until they understood the idea of the press fit principle uh, that the taper stems really started to find the, the function. So here you've actually got the press fit of the taper. Um, and what you want to do is particularly use as short a stem as possible um, and try and prepare the femur so that you can get the maximum amount of um, taper engaging in that stem. So you have to plan this. Um, and ideally, you would like to get fixation both conically at the top and the bottom, so closing the remaining bone at the top to support it at that rate. Um, and this is the press fit principle. You can get fixation here and also fixation here. And that double uh, fixation will load the bone more physiologically. Um, and the idea of the modularity is that you separate the two, you put the taper in here, you then reproduce um, the uh, bone proximally to try and enclose it around here so that you get the secondary fixation at the top end, as well as having it down at the distal end. And if possible, increase the diameter of the stem so that you can get a shorter stem because we don't necessarily want to be using a stem that goes all the way down the femur. If we can make it a couple of millimeters bigger, we can actually probably get fixation here and avoid damage to the femur further down the diaphysis. So we say, this is how you prepare it distally. You then prepare it proximally, so you get engagement of the bone at that point as well. And by separating the two, you can get fixation in this area and this area here as well. And important to bring the femur back onto the stem, because uh, that's the way you're going to physiologically get the best loading of it proximally and remodeling of the femur. Um, so, Bipolar anchoring of the stem is what we really want you to, to take home from this. There has, however, been a resurgence because of the instance of fraction of the stem potentially of monoblock revision stems, and particularly in North America again, where people had originally used the solution stem, people were looking at that. Um, there are some papers uh, coming out from this. So this was the second stage revision where they used a monoblock stem. Had some advantages in reducing inventory for the, the, how many stems you need to have but it is perhaps more difficult to absolutely restore uh, the leg length in these particular patients due to the lack of the modularity. Um, but um, some uh, papers, particularly from Vancouver, have looked at it and suggested some early promising uh, results with that. If we look at whether they're modular or, un, uh, or um, not, the limits of the uncemented st revision stems really will come into the osteoporotic femur, 
those with curved femurs about an isthmus or where the isthmus has been destroyed. So in this case, the isthmus is no longer really present. There's been an undersized taper stem used, inadequate fixation, and the stem goes on to subside substantially and goes green. If we now go on to the type four uh, type femoral stem, these are more difficult. Uh, often you can have to think about proximal femoral allografts or compaction grafting, uh, or um, you may even have to prepare a mega prosthesis to, um, to replace these. And these are the sort of examples you can get in the market. This one's got a scratch fit uh, in here. Um, but obviously more likely that you would use a cemented stem in this particular scenario, because it will actually give very good fixation of what's left of the distal femur. Um, and here's an example here where a stem has been used. Of note, you don't want the cement to necessarily go all the way down through into the knee. In this particular um, scenario, it's useful to make up calcium sulfate pellets with antibiotics that you can put into the distal femur. And these will actually prevent the cement from going down too far and possibly even into the knee joint. Um, and this is actually uh, in the literature from General Barber Plastic. Beyond doing the uh, proximal femoral replacement, you can occasionally end up having to do total femurs. Obviously, once you start getting into the knee joint, the extensor mechanism is key to function. If you don't have a, a good extensor mechanism, you're not going to get a good functional result. You'll not find them to have a reliable getting independent walking. A lot of them may become housebound when you reach this sort of salvage stage. Of interest to consider is, um, although traditionally it was all done through a lateral approach, um, a lot of times if you do this in combination with a knee surgeon, they'll be able to do a medial approach with the um, tibial side and leave you to do a lateral approach and then feed it through um, the tunnel uh, between the connecting two. Uh, and this sometimes can be better for the knee function subsequently. So here's a typical approach you'd have to do for a total femur. You've exposed the top end. There's very little in the way of bone left. Previous surgery has obviously um, removed most of the uh, trochanter region. Um, this is a tier. You can use that actually sometimes useful to do the modular cases to get the actual um, template by putting them together with that. And here it is actually being inserted interoperatively. You can see it there. An example where you might use this, this was an infected peripacetic fracture, previous cage reconstruction, had a fracture around the long stem, had a struck graft from uh, metalwork put in, had progressive fever infection and osteolysis, and there was an arthritic knee present in any case. The aspirate had grown staphylococcus, a coping of bacterium, sensitive to vancomycin. Patient went on to have a um, excision of everything um, a constrained liner given the lack of any abductor function and poor uh, rheumatoid material uh, and the rotating hinge at the bottom. Uh, microbiology, uh, inpatient vancomycin or reciprocal toxin is a one stage revision and very old packed uh, picotins toxin for six months. And at one year post operatively, there was good osseo integration and the patient is uh, satisfied uh, with the pain relief. Um, just as stated, these um, are really salvaged cases uh, and really um, shouldn't be considered unless you're really going to do them in combination with patients and they're well um, counseled. There are ones where you can coat these now in uh, pre coated in silver, or you can consider coating them in uh, various types of antibiotic solutions. Just again to say, when you've taken it out, you can use it for templating or uh, for actually putting the people in. And when we look back in our group, however, there was a 10% disarticulation rate. Patients generally ended up using welcome aids and 50% uh, managed to exit the house. So these are our salvage procedures. Um, outcome scores, you can see the OHS, WOMAC, reasonable, uh, but not perfect. Um, and something I would consider that you would always want to do with a, another surgeon, if you can, in these particular cases, and spend some time counseling the patient as well. So we'll just maybe to finish off, go through some cases. Uh, here's a 90 year old uh, female patient who had a cementless hemiarthroplasty bipolar. You can see actually this produced quite a significant protrusio defect superiorly, but you've been left with quite um, a fragmented proximal femur, um, but it is actually still got some isthmus present. Um, in this particular case, 
the impaction grafting is performed for the Pertuzio defect, which actually allows you to cement the cup to put in and the legion plate bearing on it. Um, and the taper stem uh, was used, it was built, there was enough of a scratch fit in the distal femur, and the rest of the host bone was wrapped around this to secure the double taper effect that we talked about. And the patient uh, didn't undergo any significant subsequent setup with this, I think that was a, a reasonable result. Fairly standard case, 83-year-old um, old cemented charnley, large amounts of osteolysis present. There was, um, we classify this more as a 3A. Um, if we look at the lateral, perhaps difficult to guarantee that we could get all the cement out from the top without creating an iatrogenic perforation of the stem. So in this case, it was planned to undertake an extended trochanteric osteotomy to facilitate the removal of all the distal cement. This allowed implantation of the taper uh, exactly the way as it was wished. A secondary preparation of the uh, proximal bone to allow this part of the taper to engage. A cement and cement had been performed in the acetabulum, and the extended trochanteric osteotomy secured uh, with the pellets and bag cables. And subsequently, no further substance and a satisfactory result. And finally, this patient was actually a farmer, a 63-year-old, uh, previous uh, multiple revisions. The last one he'd had was for an E. coli infection, which he had a two-stage revision. It had an impaction grafting on the acetabular side and an uh, SROM uh, device where um, it relies, as we talked about, on metatheseal fixation uh, and actually didn't have any fixation distally. Subsequent to that, really, this patient had gone on to get significant substance because the metathesis wasn't supported and the distal stem didn't ever get biological fixation because it wasn't designed to. You can see that this is actually a result of quite a large amount of erosion of bone um, anteriorly. However, note the actual diaphysis itself was reasonably intact. It was mainly the metathesis that actually had the damage. A view of this action, this would be more of a difficult case to deal with with a cement implant, as by comparing the bone here, you would create quite a stress riser um, at this point, and it would be very difficult to bypass it with any um, form of normal, non-custom made cement as implant. And you may well be relying, relying on some distal fixation, such as distal extrudes. So in this particular case, an impaction grafting was performed. This has allowed restoration of the bone stock of what was a relatively younger man. Uh, with particularly bone graft impacted down into the distal femur. Um, and this allowed um, the restoration of the bone stock again and diminution of the actual stress riser. And you can see the bone incorporated in there distally um, with whatever remodeling in due course. So really to summarize about femoral revision, I'd say conservative with a small C. If you can do cement and cement, that is ideal. If they're a younger patient, um, particularly with um, a reasonable diaphysis, I would emphasize doing an impaction grafting. If they're older and there's more extensive diaphysial damage, consider bypass fixation. However, if you undertake an extended trochanteric osteotomy or it's a peripsetic fracture, consider using a distal taper fixation for that. For type four, you may have to consider proximal femoral replacement. I think how you restrict the cement uh, in those particular cases. And if you require to do a total femur, consider undertaking that with a colleague. These patients need extensive counselling uh, because they have a high complication. And on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, give you the picture of Scott. Thanks.